fill it in. All right, well, today we're going to continue the series. It's uh, Praising Humility, where we're talking about how uh, God really loves to see humility in us and how important it is for us to pursue and to cultivate that humility before God, kind of diminish our pride, cultivate humility before God. Well, this was uh, Valentine's Day this last Tuesday. Uh, I hope you all had, did you all have a good Valentine's Day? Pretty much, yeah. You know, Valentine's Day for me has always been a little bit of a stressor, you know. It's always been associated with a little stress. And I think it even goes back to, I don't know if you had this experience, but when I was in elementary school, we would, uh, you know, celebrate Valentine's Day in class. And the way we would celebrate it is you'd get a little paper bag and you'd decorate it, put your name on it, and then you put it up on the bulletin board, you know. And the idea was that your classmates over the day would, you know, put a Valentine in your bag. Now, the room mothers at my school, they decided that the best thing to do with this is to be sure that everybody gets a valentine, that if you're going to do valentines, everybody gets one, right? So if there's 20 kids in the class, you get 20 valentines at the end of the day. And that's the way it was at my house. My mom would buy these big bags of these little valentines, and we'd have to fill one out for every single kid in the class. But of course, some families, you know, they didn't get that memo, I guess, or they didn't you know, want to do it, because I know that every year there were some kids, you know, and I'm not going to mention any names, but they didn't get 20 Valentines at the end of the day, you know. There's one kid in particular that I remember that every year he'd take down his bag, and that was very light on the Valentines, I have to say. And it's not right, you know. Every kid should have a Valentine, just like the way we feel like everybody should have love, right? And we think about God that way, that God gives his love to everybody, and everybody should experience God's love. Isn't that right? We want that. That's what we want for people. In fact, when we first, you know, get into the church or as little kids like the guys who just left, they'll usually learn that little piece of 1 John that says what? God is love. God is love. And the thing about that is... People in church know that verse or that little piece of that verse, but even people who are not in the church, people who are not in the church and not even attached to the Bible in any way, they know that part of that verse. God is love. And I mean, even people, and a lot of people do this, people who are kind of inventing their own idea of God, like they really have no interest in seeking out who God is from Scripture. They're just kind of picking and choosing of all kinds of different ways of thinking and all kinds of thoughts that they have to kind of invent their own God, their own version of God that they worship. But they'll always grab onto that one. God is love because it's non-controversial. It's God is love. Who would not want a God who is love, right? But the thing about it is when you do try When you are connected to church, you do try to discover who God is in the Bible. You've always got to have a next level kind of thinking. God is love is not just going to be enough, right? For people who are really attached to the Bible, people who really want to know who God is and how God loves, if you hear God is love, the next thing you got to ask is, well, what is love? How do you define love? What is love? Is every form of sexual expression love? A lot of people think that. Is love all about self-fulfillment? A lot of people think that. Is love all about sacrifice? A lot of people think that. Is love all about um, boundaries, making sure that we have healthy boundaries? Is that love? Or is love just about uh, freedom, libertinism, just being able to do whatever you want? Or is it all of those things just depending on who you are and where you happen to be in your life or what you happen to think that morning? So what is love? It it becomes a big question. Now, when we look at Scripture, what is love becomes really important. Now, God is love. God does love everyone. But God's love is not a blanket kind of love. It's not an everybody gets a valentine kind of love. 
Because after all, the people that I gave Valentine's to, you know, half those people in my class, I didn't really know them. I didn't really think much about them. But that's kind of the difference. God does think about you. God knows you. God loves you personally. He knows your name. He knows why you were given the name you were given. He knows whether or not you like your name. He knows whether or not you're actually using your real name right now. God knows your character. God knows all of your background, all of your genetics, all of your history, all of your experiences, all of the things that make you who you are today. God knows, and God loves you. He knows all your wants, all your desires, all your needs, all your fears. God knows everything about you and loves you more than you love yourself. He loves you more than you love yourself. He knows you better than you know yourself. So God is love, but it's a particular kind of love. It's a personal love. It's a particular love. It's particular to you. And he loves you intensely. But here's the other side of God's love that we don't talk about a whole lot, that we need to talk about if we're going to start to really humble ourselves before God. Kind of part of God's love that we don't talk about a lot. The thing is, as personally and as particularly and as intensely as God loves you, God hates your and my particular sin, our personal sin. And he hates it with the same intensity that he loves you. The same kind of intensity that he loves you, he hates your sin. And here's why, because our sin, our particular sin, our personal sin is opposed to God's love. It's opposed to his love. It's our sin rejects God's love. So in a sense, God's perfect love for us is expressed also in his hatred and anger against the sin that opposes him in us. Much as God loves us, he hates our sin. Now, that's not something that we, we really like to hear about a lot, even in church. We don't like to talk about it uh, even in church. Truth of it is, if we don't wrap our minds around that, then we don't ever really get close to knowing who God really is and knowing the way that he really loves us hard for us to, to wrap our minds around that. We don't really like it. Because to start to see God for who he really is and see ourselves for who we really are, in order to do that, we have to start giving up a little bit of what we'd prefer to think of God as and what we would prefer to think of ourselves as. And that is really hard to do. It means that we have to push down and get rid of and diminish our pride hard for us to do. It's hard for every Christian who's ever come before us to do. It was hard for Jesus' disciples, the people who were hanging out with Jesus. It was hard for them to do, to see who Jesus really was and understand who they really were in relation to Jesus. On Wednesday, we're going to go into this season of Lent. And the season of Lent is, corresponds to the 40 days that Jesus actually wrestled with sin. He wrestled with sin. He was under attack from Satan. He was wrestling with sin. In preparation for his being able to actually go and accomplish the mission that God had for him. That's what those 40 days of Lent, what they were to remind us of. But they also correspond to that period of time in that third year of Jesus' ministry as he approached Jerusalem, as he approached that moment when he was going to, to, to experience the culmination of his ministry on the cross and in his death for you and me. In those days leading up to that event, Jesus tried to help his disciples see 
who he really is, what his real mission was, and then by extension, what they needed to start to think of in order for them to pursue God truthfully and to carry out their mission. Now, these disciples had been going along thinking and hoping for their version of what Jesus' mission would be, which would be to come into Jerusalem to declare a new kingdom, and then they would be right there alongside Jesus. That's what they wanted, but Jesus had to help them understand if they were going to really accomplish their their mission, he needed to let them know what was really coming down the pike for them. In Mark chapter 8, he says that Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, that he must be killed and after three days rise again. It says he spoke to them plainly about these things. So he is pretty clear, pretty upfront about these things. He says another time soon after that, he told his disciples... The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. He will, they will kill him. And after three days, he will rise. So again, he's being super clear about what's coming next for he and for the disciples. And finally, just before they went into Jerusalem, just before they went to experience the culmination of his ministry on the cross, he said to them, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and they will condemn him to death, and they will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him, and three days later, he will rise. Now, I don't understand how they could hear Jesus say this and ignore it or misinterpret it, but guess what? When it came to ignoring Jesus and misinterpreting Jesus and looking at things their own way, the disciples, just like us, they were always up for the challenge. (laughs) And even though Jesus was this explicit about what was coming when they entered Jerusalem, after Jesus told them this, two of his disciples, James and John, they came to him and they said, well, Jesus, can you give us a place of power? and position next to you when you come into your kingdom. Still thinking, still believing, still insisting that what there, that despite what Jesus was saying, that he was going to come into Jerusalem and make this great kingdom, and that they, in their pride, would have place and position and power. That's what they were hearing. That's what they wanted. But it had nothing to do with what Jesus was telling them who Jesus really was, what his mission really was, and by extension, what they would need to start to do in order to serve him and love him as they went forward. See, we do this too. We do this too. It's not just them, it's us. When it comes to thinking about God's great love for us, but also wrapping our minds around his anger and his wrath at our sin, it's hard for us to accept that. It's hard for us to reconcile those two things. But here's the thing. It's the way God reconciles those two things. That is the heart of the gospel. It's the heart of the gospel. We all, all of us, have a tendency towards the sin of pride and of thinking a little bit better of ourselves than we really are. We have this notion and we deceive ourselves into this notion of thinking that God grades on a curve. And as long as we're better than the next guy, the guy next to us, or we're better than the worst person that we know, well, then God is going to be accepting of us. We are going to be acceptable to God. But that's not the way it is. It's not the way it is. Paul says in Romans, and this is for us to remember, There is no one righteous, not even one. 
There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Now, Paul isn't saying that we don't do good things sometimes because we do. We all know that we do. God has planted his law in our hearts. We know good from evil, and sometimes we even choose to do good. But that's not the point. The point isn't that we sometimes do good things. The point of the gospel is that God is wholly good. He is holy. He is perfect. And his standard is perfection. And at the same time, God is just in his judgments. And we are caught in the middle. In our imperfection, in our sin, we are caught between God's perfection and his perfect judgments. And we cannot be perfect and we cannot escape his judgment. And so in his love, in his love, he put Jesus in our place. Fact of it is, the fact of the gospel is, God's love met his wrath on the cross in Jesus. Because he died, we are spared. Amen? That's love. That's agape love. That is gospel love. the love that God has for you personally. Isaiah said Jesus was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquity. says God is love then he defines it says this is love not that we loved God but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins there's a question for all of us here is have we availed ourselves of that love taken hold and accepted that love. Because it's only in that love that we can escape God's wrath. It's only in that love that we can be reconciled to God. It's only in that love that we can gain heaven and eternal life. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, he would ask this question of any class, any band, any congregation that he found himself in front of. Do you desire to escape the wrath to come and be saved from your sins? The question for every one of us, it's a question for everybody watching out there, you desire to escape the wrath to come and be saved from your sins. If you've never repented of your sins, ask God to forgive you and accepted the sacrifice of Jesus in your place. And today is the day we only have this life to make those decisions. If sometime in the past we have repented of our sins, we've asked God to forgive us, and we've accepted. We 
accepted that sacrifice that Jesus made for us. Yet, today, somehow we've lost the joy of knowing that salvation. Somehow we've lost the fire of that Holy Spirit within us. And today's the day. Rekindle that spirit. Recommit. To rededicate. To re-accept the good news of the gospel. God loves each and every one of us and every single person in the world. But he loves us with that deep, abiding, agape love that can transform your life and my life it can transform this world as I say you know we're not going to be able to talk our way out of all the problems we have in this world but the Holy Spirit can lift us out beginning with each one of us so let's pray your God We need to know who you really are and who we really are so that we might humble ourselves before you so that your spirit might truly come alive within us. We ask God that you do that saving work within us, within our families, within all the people that we know. We ask, oh God, that you ignite your Holy Spirit within us. 